All right, let's crack on. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me for this webinar on freedom of speech and equality in higher education. My name is Sam Fowles. I'm a barrister specialising in public law and human rights, which means uh, essentially uh, I practice any area of law which involves the power of the state, which of course uh, this new act does. Um, I've argued cases uh, all the way uh, from the Supreme Court to the, the very uh, most junior tribunal. Um, some cases that you may have heard of uh, are that I've been involved in uh, include um, the uh, Gina Miller litigation, um, overturning the prorogation of Parliament in 2019, uh, the Clapham Common inquiry into policing of the vigil to mark the death of Sarah Everard, um, and recently, I've been involved in the case between the United Kingdom government and the Scottish government concerning the Gender Recognition uh, Reform Bill. Uh, I act for a full range of clients, uh, ranging from uh, national government organisations to local governments, but also uh, NGO, uh, individuals, of course, and most importantly, for uh, education providers. I also serve as director of the Institute for Constitutional and Democratic Research, and in that capacity, I work with MPs uh, on constitutional and democratic policy, um, and I have an academic position at Oxford. The purpose uh, of this talk um, is to firstly uh, help the process of, uh, of everyone familiarising themselves with the, uh, the higher education freedom of speech Act, which is obviously um, a significant new regulatory uh, issue for uh, for higher education providers, uh, but perhaps more importantly, it's to try and set that act in its wider legal context. Because um, obviously, it was when it was introduced, the focus naturally was on this act, and it's important to remember. Uh, the, the Freedom of Speech Act it is not the be-all and end-all. It's part of a matrix of different legal duties which protect human rights and equalities in the round. And it's important to be un that it's understood in that context. Um, so with that in mind, I'll start off by looking at the key provisions um, of the Freedom of Speech Act, but then I'll go on to look at other, and I've put a ex exclamation point here to emphasize it, equally important legal duties. These that didn't just fall away when the act was passed. And then we'll get a bit more practical and look at the challenges of higher education providers that these, these bring up and uh, give you some proposals to respond to those challenges. And I'll leave a little time for questions um, at the end. Uh, if you want to uh, I, th I think probably what uh, the, the best thing to do is uh, put questions in the question function um, or the chat. But uh, if that's uh, if the technology doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't take us all the way on that one, then I'll um, I'll just open it up for people to come on uh, on screen at the end. So the Freedom of Speech Act, well, I think we need to acknowledge, and I'll just, in fact, as I've as I've pulled this up, I did want to I wanted to pause and give you um, maybe a bit of a a trigger warning at the um, at the start of this. Um, this is an act that came into being in uh, in controversial circumstances. Um, it's, it was pointed out at the time that it was uh, was being passed that in the in the preceding ten years there have been just seven um, recorded uh, student complaints about the content of curriculum. Uh, only six speakers were cancelled, and zero books were uh, removed from libraries on the basis of uh, of equality's concerns. Um, of those six speakers that were cancelled, uh, one was cancelled because they were accused of rape, and another because. Uh, they brought a number of self-declared Nazi organizations with them. Um, so we go into this with, um, I think, at least an acknowledgement of the political context that it, uh, it came about. Um, 
I want to try and give you uh, my legal analysis, my lawyer's uh, analysis, and give you uh, my opinion as a lawyer, not as a commentator. Um, my criticism of a lot of, uh, in, indeed, commentators and, and lawyer slash commentators who have been involved um, in this area um, of public policy and practice. And for example, my quick criticism of Akua Reindorf's report is that they um, essentially start from the position of activists and they use their legal analysis to support their um, political and, and Akua's case, uh, gender critical politics. Um, and that's approaching a lawyer's job as an activist rather than a lawyer. Um, Obviously, we uh, people like me get called activist lawyers a lot, and I really reject that um, label because I think if you're being an activist, you're not being a good lawyer. Our job is to be try and step back and be dispassionate. Um, of course, that's not always possible, um, and so I wanted to be completely honest with you. Um, those uh, those of you with, uh, in the um, the IR or if history. Um, Areas of uh, of higher education will be familiar with the uh, EH cards um, uh, point that any bit of history tells you as much about the historian as it does about the period under study. Um, I fully accept that trying to pretend that one is totally objective is uh, often a recipe for disaster, and it's much better to just acknowledge one's own limitations. Um, so. That's my trigger warning. My personal po politics is that I'm skeptical. Have been skeptical of of bringing that in. I'm going to try and set those aside and give you the uh, uh, my lawyer's analysis. But it's only fair to just be upfront and honest uh, about where I'm uh, where I am personally. Um, with that in mind, let's get on to the law. Uh, the Freedom of Speech Act essentially introduces duties on five key limbs. Uh, it introduces duties for higher education providers, for student unions, gives creates new powers for the office for students, and creates a statutory tort. And a a tort is essentially a civil wrong. It's something that you can be sued for. Is probably the best way of understanding it. Um, and it places limitations on non disclosure agreements. This last point, limitations on NDA, I'm not really going to cover because it's almost an entirely separate issue. Um, if anyone wants uh, uh, wants some assistance on that part of the act, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to um, provide that in a, a call or exchange of emails or, or something like that. Um, beginning then with the higher education provider duties, and this is in section one. It's not in force just yet, but it will be soon. And the key duty is to take reasonably practical steps to secure freedom of speech within the law. And quotation marks there, that's a direct quote. So freedom of speech within the law for staff members, students and speakers. Um, and I'm just pausing there because that's uh, those two uh bits of the statute, those two bits of language that I've quoted um, are very important because it means this is not an absolute duty. Firstly, you're only required to take reasonably practical steps, which means you've got to think what is what's possible here. I don't need to go uh, I don't need to go to an extreme or absurd lengths. I need to take just they need to do what is practical, not just what is practical, but what's reasonable in the situation. And the, the ex, it protects freedom of speech within the law. And the law itself, as we'll come on to in a, in a moment, already places limitations on freedom of speech. Uh, the rights to freedom of speech and the human rights uh, protected by the Human Rights Act uh, and enshrined in the European Convention uh, is a qualified right. It doesn't allow you to say anything you want. Um, it allows you to say anything you want subject to proportionate restrictions. And that means uh, restrictions that fulfill a public policy necessity and don't go any further than is necessary to fulfill that public policy necessity. So, for example, um, hate speech, it's, it's outlawing hate speech uh, is not 
a, a unlawful un, under the European Convention and would not be un, unlawful within uh, under this Act. Uh, this, in terms of where where you have to supply uh, to secure freedom of speech or what you have to do uh, to to secure it, um, it involves the use of premises. So ensuring that um, when you're uh, permitting speeches or invite holding speeches or lectures or debates on uh, on pr- on your premises, um, you're not restricting uh, freedom of speech within the law, um, and perhaps important uh, most importantly. Um, it requires you to ensure that there is no um, adverse effects uh, that are imposed upon students, staff, um, or external speakers as a result of uh, ex- exercising their freedom of expression. It means you can't impose the costs of security on external speakers, and this is this is obviously referencing cases where you've had large. Um, at large protests against uh, against certain speakers. Um, it also, and this is perhaps where the uh, the administrative work needs to start, requires universities and, and higher education providers to have a code of practice, an internal code of practice, which sets out how, in in practice, they intend to uh, to discharge these duties. Uh, the duty sits uh, on the duty is also on the governing body of the university to promote uh, freedom of expression. That's higher education providers, but that's not where the duties end, because they are also. Um, oh, this is the the definition of of academic freedom. Uh, uh, I should should have added the definition of academic freedom that you're required to promote. Um, freedom within the law to test and question and test received wisdom and to put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without placing themselves at risk of adverse effect. And so you should not see uh, a loss of your job or further privileges or a loss of the ability to secure promotion as a result of things that you've said. These duties are also placed on the student unions, and those essentially replicate the higher education provider uh, duties. Um, they are the same in terms of speakers and in terms of premises, but they also apply to the affiliation of student societies. Um, and so, for example, and ex- taking an example from when I was at university, uh, my student union. Um, declined uh, to affiliate the pro-life uh, society um, because it had connections with American organizations that had been involved in um, uh, terrorist acts at abortion providers. Um, now, the I think probably that decision would still stand because we're looking at freedom of speech within the law, but I think that it's a decision that would have to be much more carefully scrutinized. Um, So mere disagreement uh, between the student union um, and a particular society that seeks affiliation is, uh, would no longer be grounds for refusing to affiliate that society. Um, Interestingly, student unions must also um, maintain a code of practice. Now, I think there is uh, nothing to prevent universities and student unions working together on the code of practice. So perhaps the um, student union code is a chapter of the uh, the university or higher education provider as a whole's code of practice. Um, but it does mean the students unions have got to have have got to have one, and it means they've got to do the work. That's the duties. What about the powers? Well, this is where we get to the Office for Students. And there is a general duty placed on the Office for Students for to respect uh, to protect freedom of speech, and that's in section five. Um, but the Office for Students can also uh, now inspect your governing documents and require you to protect freedom of speech in those governing documents. That's section six. Um, The 
the OFS can now monitor student union compliance with the requirements of the Act, that's Section 7, and maintain um, a list of student unions to which the duties apply. It can fine student unions, although um, the extent of those fines is as yet unclear because it relies on regulations that are, are still being finalised. Um, it can require reports from student unions and it uh, operates a free complaint scheme. One of the sections of the Act that is now in force is the creation of a free speech champion. And this is a person that's paid by the government to champion free speech um, in, in student unions and, and essentially um, to take this aspect of the OFS's work forward. Now, this really fundamentally changes the status of student unions. Previously, student unions were essentially private members clubs. Um, and the the way the law worked was very, very similar for these the, for the two. Um, they're now publicly regulated organizations, um, although not receiving direct public funding, although many re re receive funding, of course, from higher education providers. But this means there's a substantial increase in the bureaucracy that student unions are going to have to deal with. Um, that's going to likely have substantial financial implications and student unions are really going to need support uh, to deal with this. It also means that student unions are particularly vulnerable to litigation. Um, most work on relatively shoestring budgets and will be very worried about the exercise of OFS powers because they're going to find it hard to find the resources to uh, challenge a decision of the OFS. Um, they're going to find it much more difficult than uh, higher education providers as a whole, for example, to instruct lawyers to take legal advice. Um, it's likely that the OFS will, will see them as a sort of easy target for regulation for this reason, um, particularly as student unions are also the most responsive, for obvious reasons, to student body pressure and campaigning. And so it's. I think the there's a real... Um, what we would call a, a regulatory or a litigation risk in respect of student unions. The final um, aspect of the, uh, the act that I want to mention is the statutory tort. And this uh, is part of the act that allows individuals to claim against either a higher education provider or a student union um, for financial remedy in essence, um, if any of the duties in the Act are breached. So it's not just um, the OFS that can enforce this Act, it's individuals as well. Now, in order to, uh, to succeed in a claim, um, a potential claimant is going to have to prove loss. And this might be a, a bit of a challenge. Um, a lot of lawyers have said it's going to be very difficult to see how you uh, prove loss in this situation. If, for example, you're a, a stu you're a, an external speaker that has been invited, um, and then the pe uh, the group that's inviting you has changed their minds uh, because of um, extreme opinions that you've uh, you've mentioned. If you weren't getting a fee, um, if you're reimbursed for all of your um, your travel expenses. Um, where does the financial loss come from? And it's likely to be a more sort of nebulous um, concept of loss like injury to feelings, which is quite quite difficult to, not ne necessarily difficult to prove if you're asking for you know, 500 quid, but difficult to prove if in, in the case of a really serious financial claim. However, it's not, there's not just a monetary remedy you can also uh, get an injunction. And this is a court order requiring um, the higher education provider or the student union to do something and most likely requiring them not to cancel a particular, uh, particular scheduled um, speech or debate. Now, it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out and see how far that goes, because in, in a moment we're going to get on to talking about uh, student uh, opposition and student protests and critique and challenge. Um, 
whether it'll be interesting to see whether um firstly claimants try to not rely on injunctions not just to uh make I- ensure that they they get to speak but will they also rely on injunctions to uh prevent protests against them i think it will be very very difficult to do so and to succeed on that uh, for the reasons i'll come on to uh, but I think it's very possible it might be attempted. Uh, In order to gain financial relief on the basis of the the tort, uh, you need to have gone through a complaint scheme first, um, although you don't have have to have your complaint upheld. Um, For the injunction, you don't need that. Um, I think the tort will apply to... um, both in theory, both withdrawal and non-invitation. Non-invitation is obviously very difficult to prove. How do you prove um, that the reason you didn't get invited to speak at a university was uh, because of a particular opinion you held? I mean, there are literally millions of people that don't get invited to speak at universities every single day. Um, I've al- the, we've already talked about how proving loss uh, might be uh, might be tricky, and so the I think it's likely that a lot of these uh, a lot of tort claims will be more about making a sort of political point than they will about genuinely trying to recoup some sort of of loss. But that doesn't mean they won't happen, um, and in fact. Uh, we've we've seen quite a few cases recently uh, where the claimant actually pretty much recognised they were going to lose, um, but the media attention that is generated by a court case um, is is sort of a win in of itself for cer- certain claimants. Um, so that's the Freedom of Speech Act, but that's not where this ends because. It sits within a matrix of other very important and some arguably more important uh, legal duties. So where does this start? First, the rights to protest. Now, this uh, is a right that's been protected at common law uh, since the Peterloo massacre in the 19th century. Um, It was in... um, recognized uh, in common law in the 20th century in a case called Hubbard and Pitt by the famous judge Lord Denning, and it's recognized as part of Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights, given effect in the UK by the Human Rights Act. Um, universities, as public as with other public bodies, have a, a, a duty in law to act in accordance with these rights. The right to protest has two limbs. There's the negative limb, which is um, is essentially saying you can't stop uh, or you shouldn't stop protest except in certain conditions, and also the positive limb, and that is um, a requirement on emanations and em- uh, very difficult word, difficult word to say there emanations of the state um, to facilitate lawful and peaceful protest. Now, of course, recently we've seen the passage of the Public Order Act and the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act. And these give particularly police, but some other public bodies, um, powers to legally limit protests if they cause too much of a disturbance. However, uh, it's less likely that these are going to apply in a university context. as often protests on university campuses don't involve police, although I appreciate some have. Um, But even if it does apply uh, in practice, these powers have to be exercised subject to the rights in Article 11 of the ECHR and the common law duties. And that that was recognized um, by the High Court very recently um, in the, the case that came out of the Clapham Common Vigil. What about the right to freedom of expression itself? This is found in the common law, but it's also found in Article 10 of the ECHR. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a qualified right. So it can uh, interference can be permitted if that in interference is itself permitted by law, if it's necessary in a democratic society, and if it's proportionate. And what this means is um, you uh, it's the the ECHR essentially recognizing that sometimes you have a clash of rights and you've got different competing rights. And this proportionality uh, qualification allows you to, uh, a decision maker, to balance the various competing rights. Um, and a good example of this is a, a case uh, called the Otto Preminger Institu Institute um, case, which was a, an ECHR, uh, European Court of Human Rights case, happened in Germany. Um, and that was about a film being shown uh, that was incredibly insulting to the Catholic faith. Um, and the local government uh, wouldn't permit the, uh, the the cinema to to show this film. The cinema um, brought a claim against them. Uh, and the court said, essentially, yes, you have a prima facie right to show this film. But it is it's not just that it's offensive, it's that it's gratuitously offensive. You're not trying to make an, a, a point here, a wider point. You're, the, the only purpose of this is to be as offensive as possible to Catholic people. And so therefore, the state's interference with the right to freedom of ex expression is lawful in this case. Um, and this, so it's acknowledged that freedom of expression uh, does not permit necessarily the abuse of tolerance. Um, it's also uh, enshrined in the convention that freedom of expression does not support um, freedom of ex expression, uh, the, the expression supporting the denial of rights to others. And so, for example, um, it doesn't present, uh, for obvious reasons, does not protect um, fascist or Nazi beliefs. It doesn't protect um, inciting violence. Um, Kate, and there was a case called Norwood in the UK where it was uh, the more extreme BNP beliefs were found not to be protected by the right to freedom of expression. It doesn't support extreme homophobia. Um, and that was established in a case called Leendal in Iceland. And it, uh, that was, and that interestingly was a case that didn't involve the incitement of violence. So it's simply the expression of extreme homophobia. Um, there's also a number of duties in criminal law that it's uh, worth being aware of. Um, threats or incitement to violence um, and malicious communications are unlawful. Separately from that, there are data protection rights. So, for example, doxing is, is an, not a criminally, necessarily a criminally unlawful act, but it is an unlawful act uh, in civil law. And then we come, of course, to the Equalities Act, the Equality Act. The most important aspect of this is Section 149, which I'm sure uh, you will all be very familiar with. Um, the bundle of duties known as the public sector equality duty. And um, this is a general duty to eliminate uh, prohibited conduct. And that's the conduct that the, the Act prohibits. Uh, so discrimination and harassment. Um, it's to, but also there's a positive duty to advance equality of opportunity and to remove or minimize, minimize the disadvantages um, that marginalized groups suffer and to foster good relations between those groups and uh, other groups in society. So, and what the, the important thing to think about uh, here is this is just not, this is not a negative duty. This is not saying don't discriminate against people. This is saying you actively have to make an effort um, to stop others discriminating against people and also to positively enhance equality of opportunity. Of course, the Act also um, prohibits uh, discrimination in a direct form, but also in indirect form. And indirect discrimination is if you have a provision, criterion, or practice uh, that has a more of a negative effect on one group or, or than another. Now, direct discrimination can, however, uh, be lawful. 
if it is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Of course, um, harassment is uh, is also prohibited under the Act. Um, what does this mean in practice? Well, um, let's look at a, a few, a, a bit of um, myth busting. Uh, so obviously there is a list in the Act of uh, protected uh, classes of people. And I've chosen uh, the, the, the myth that I want to, to take on here is the idea that tran uh, trans people um, are not protected. And this is something um, that came in the Reindorf report that said gender identity and trans status are not protected um, under the Equality Act. That's wrong. Um, a case called Taylor and Jaguar uh, establishes that, that going through the process uh, of transition, any stage of the process, um, or being gender fluid or non-binary, those are protected classes under the Act. Um, but simultaneously, the Act protects uh, religion and belief. Um, and when deciding whether a particular religion or belief is, uh, is one that... Uh, gains protection under the Act, we have to look at something called the Granger test, and that, and which requires a decision maker to ask themselves, is this belief genuine? Is it, um, or is it merely transitory? Is it part of a substantial issue? Uh, is it cogent? And is it worthy of respect in a democratic society? Um, in the Maya Forstarter case, it was established that the belief that biological sex is immutable is a protected belief. But again, uh, we need to do another bit of myth-busting myth here. That does not apply to all gender-critical beliefs. It's just the four-starter case only extends to that specific belief. Um, it's also important to note that the, uh, the belief itself might be different from the expression of that belief. So a belief might be protected, but you might be expressing it uh, in a way that is not protected. Uh, and so, for example, um, dis expressing it in a, in a disruptive or inappropriate manner might may not be protected, even if the belief itself is protected. Um, now, the, uh, the other... Um, and, and, myth to, to bust so to speak is the um is the, the bailey case and that's that was uh another sort of religion and belief equalities act case that was widely reported um and it was reported as uh, uh that it involved a a a lawyer uh, the at garden court chambers um who sued not only garden court chambers um but also stonewall um because uh Stonewall had criticised her for beliefs that she has expressed in public, and they Stonewall had complained to uh, to her her chambers, um, and as a result, her chambers um, had uh, disciplined her, and eventually she had left. Um, the court found that um, her chambers had acted unlawfully, but only on a fairly narrow technical point. However, it found that Stonewall's criticism of her was lawful. Um, and that's a uh, a very important um, point to remember when approaching this whole issue, that it's not just the expression of a belief that is protected, but the criticism of someone for expressing that belief. That's also protected in law. So we've got a big network, a morass of, uh, of different legal duties, some of which may clash. What challenges does that present for higher education? Well, I'm going to, I'm sure there's, there's a, a plethora, I'm going to identify uh, just a few. Um, the first is the, uh, the risk that it will reduce academic standards. Um, the Freedom of Speech uh, Act, in practice, isn't just protecting freedom of speech, it's creating a right to a platform, um, or may appear I should say, to be creating a right to a platform and saying that if it's not it's not just a matter of you shouldn't be punished for um, expressing a particular opinion, but you should be allowed a platform funded by the university to do that. 
And the there's a real risk here that a university, an academic platform, becomes justified simply by having an opinion. Um, and it's worth noting that many, although not all, of the recent sort of council culture controversies involve speakers who are not necessarily qualified to be speaking about their topic. Um, one that uh, that uh, flies up to me, and the reason that I've I've used a lot of examples about the from the trans debate um, isn't isn't particularly to force one opinion in that debate on uh, on you or or not. It's simply that that's the that's the context of freedom of speech in the in in the news and in the um, uh, in the legal sector that that's cropped up a lot recently. Um, so one. Uh, one issue that I was was very aware of was, was Kathleen Stock speaking at invited to speak at the Oxford Union. Um, now, Kathleen Stock is obviously as entitled to freedom of expression as everyone else, but she's never published a peer reviewed paper on trans issues. She's got no recognised uh, academic um, expertise in that area, and yet um, she uh, she holds herself out as, as being an expert in it. Um, now, which got me thinking, could you transfer that over? Uh, would you give a platform to someone to speak about, I don't know, intellectual property law who had no academic expertise in intellectual property law? Or the do, uh, to do an art history lecture on Titian, um, who probably like me, could not identify a Titian painting if it hit them in the face. Um, so there's a real danger that, uh, that academic expertise, which is obviously central um, to what we, uh, we do at universities, is uh, replaced as a sort of qualifying factor um, by simply having an opinion and demanding a, um, a platform for it. Um, there is a uh, a danger as well um, that academic freedom is framed simply as freedom from criticism. And uh, it was the recent case of, of Matthew Goodwin, who works for a think tank, I, I think, um, but used to work in a uh, used to have an academic position. And um, he claimed that his his academic freedom was being um, uh, being infringed because uh, some colleagues described his work as problematic. Uh, now, I certainly remember when uh, I was doing my uh, my PhD, my supervisor said a lot worse about my work than that it was uh, was problematic. And in fact, um, the essence of the academy is criticising each other's work. And sometimes, certainly in my case, um, saying it's not very good. That's you just that piece of work is just not up to scratch. Um, the point is critique. And so I think it's it's really important that that can be preserved. The next challenge I want to talk about is that free speech becomes privileged speech. Um, the What I mean here um, is that there's a danger that um, the Freedom of Speech Act doesn't apply equally. Um, and that's so there are uh, which and what you often see is uh in around free speech so-called free speech controversies is not a speaker being denied a platform or being denied the ability to speak it's a speaker being criticized or protested against once they're on that platform and a good example of this um is the uh what happened in in durham a couple of uh, years ago um where a um uh I think a contrarian journalist is probably the best way to describe him, um, gave a speech, um, was invited to give a speech at a Christmas dinner at a Durham College. Um, he made a number of remarks to which students objected and students voiced their objection. Um, he was booed and students walked out. And this was uh, th this was sort of packaged as an assault on his freedom of speech. Um, and in, in, and indeed, under the Freedom of Speech Act, he may have been able to bring a tort claim um, against the uh, against the uh, 
the, the college, perhaps, or even the university. Um, we may have even, the OFS may uh, even have considered using its, uh, its new powers to get involved. Um, but the thing to, re uh, the problem there is that the students were simply expressing their freedom of expression. So you've got a bit of a clash of rights there. Um, the other uh, aspect of this is that uh, something that I call the Miltonian fallacy, and that comes from uh, Milton's uh, famous exhortation to let truth and falsehood battle, um, and the truth will always be the winner. And it's this idea that you um, that basically when you've got two um, two different views and you can set them up in a sort of Lincoln Douglas style debate, uh, that's going to be a fair fight. But often it's not. Sometimes setting up a, a sort of Lincoln Douglas face off of, of views is entirely unrepresentative. And so, for example, um, setting a, up a climate scientist against uh, to debate against a climate change denier. Um, that is that's not representative of the, the view of, of, of the scientific, uh, the consensus of the scientific community. But also when you set up a minoritized group to debate against someone um, who is for persecuting them. So, for example, uh, because um, if you have a, you know, a, a speaker um, that is, I don't know, like me, white, middle class, privileged, um, and they want to give their probably potentially, you know, very well uh, thought out uh, views on why immigrants shouldn't be uh, allowed in the country. Um, and you uh, debate, set them up to debate against someone who has come in on a small boat fleeing persecution. Now, one of those people is engaged in an intellectual exercise. One of those people is fighting for their life. It's not a fair fight. And so there's a, a danger that this sort of, uh, the approaching the Freedom of Speech Act in a certain way um, will be work contrary to equalities and, and other duties by setting up um, essentially protecting and enhancing speech of privileged groups and disenhancing the speech of marginalized groups. Um, there's also, um, in many cases, uh, uh, where speech is challenged, it's not even a debate at all. And so, for example, um, when uh, Kathleen Stock recently spoke at the Oxford Union, she wasn't, there wasn't a debate, there wasn't a, a, an opposition speaker. It was an entirely unchallenged, privileged platform. Um, the next challenge is that these, uh, these duties lead to polarization and extremism. Um, the Freedom of Speech Act is probably going to be most useful to you if you've got a really extreme perspective because that generates controversy, it gets you attention, and now that controversy and attention is protected in law. It's a sad uh, thing that uh, those, those of us in the academy have to realise that controversy sells probably better than carefully reasoned analysis. Um, and so there is a, uh, but also controversy crowds out carefully reasoned analysis and it breeds a sort of polarised uh, discourse. Um, it also benefits the better funded. Um, it's much, whereas uh, if you have to justify your rights, justify your, your platform and, and justify getting on a platform um, by, uh, by justifying your opinion, um, then that's much, that, there's a level of equality to that. Lots of uh, people from different backgrounds can justify that. However, if everyone is entitled to a platform, it benefits the better funded. Um, so I think there's a where academic discourse works best in a in this sort of middle ground that is analytical and forensic, sometimes a bit boring. Um, the interpreting the Freedom of Speech Act of everyone gets a platform um, is likely to take us away from that productive ground. Um, and then, of course, there is the perennial challenge that this act gives the government a lot more control. 
It's given that the government now has more control over academic dis- uh, discourse than ever before. Um, the government has been very, very clear in saying that its uh, its priorities are are now influenced by the cultural war discourse because that's what it thinks it's going to win is going to win at the election. And there's a um, which uh, and I say that not to sort of attack the government, um, but to explain the risks. Um, this there is a political incentive to pursue uh, easy tort cases. There's a political assen- incentive to pursue regulatory cases. And it's likely in the first instance uh, that they'll be picked on, uh, the easy targets such as student unions will be picked on. Um, it's also necessary to recognise the litigation risk for private tort cases. Um, the groups that most um, promote uh, so, uh, so-called so free speech discourses tend to be uh, funded um, very, very well, uh, often by foreign Billionaires. So, for example, the Free Speech Union gets uh, and and associated uh, organisation gets a lot get a lot of funding uh, from Peter Thiel, um, or Peter Thiel, who is uh, who runs uh, runs Palantir, which is a data mining um, organisation. And so, it's go where you have these uh, sort of this big money backing. Uh, it's very easy to run a lot of these tort cases uh, to get attention to get to get press attention. And so the the litigation risk doesn't just come from um, it, cases that um, we might approach like you'd approach a, a negligence case, for example, and say, you know, how strong is this case? Um, if it's not very strong, it's not a risk we don't need to worry about. Um, these the risk, the litigation risk here is slightly different. Um, because even if it's not a strong case, it's likely there's there's a chance it could be pursued and uh, for political purposes. So, what's the response? Um, I've got four recommendations. The first is to approach this matrix of duties with a focus on quality, um, not content. Free- the Freedom of Speech Act preserves institutional independence. And the duties, as I mentioned, are qualified. So they must leave space for academic discernment. Um, so my uh, my advice is certainly don't go about um, choosing people for platforms based on what they're saying. But it is still lawful, um, in my analysis, to um, choose people for platforms based on their qualification for that platform their publications, their expertise, their professional experience, but also whether they've got a history of um, spreading misinformation, whether they've made a a, a contribution to academic discourse. My view is that this approach, um, and this can be set out in, uh, and can and should be set out in in policies and codes, not done in an ad hoc way, um, but if properly set out, would be lawful under the Act. Second is to make sure, given now that there is a there's a, a requirement to uh, to platform speakers, to make sure that this doesn't become a requirement to also silence dissent. Um, I use this. So this is this is Kathleen Stock at the at the Oxford Union, and in front of her is a protester um, that glued themselves to the floor. Both of those people are expressing, are enjoying freedom of expression. Both of those uh, types of speech are protected by the right to freedom of expression and also, um, in the case of the protester, the right to protest. Now, it's likely going to be fairly problematic um, to sort of, dis- to sort of descend into, into ad hoc protests. Um, but there's no need for that. There's a way, a, an obvious way round within the law, um, the problem of controversial speakers and people protesting against controversial speakers is to give protesters or give critics a chance to challenge them and to debate them. So um, where you have this sort of uh, controversy in two sides, rather than um, 
giving one a privileged platform and putting the others behind barricades, simply have them share uh, the platform. Of course, subject to the caveats that I mentioned uh, about the qualities considerations earlier. Um, but also, remember, you have an, uh, uh, a duty to facilitate peaceful protest. And so treating protesters like um, miscreants and kind of locking them out the room is perhaps not the best way uh, to go about this. It won't always solve the problem, but it might take the heat out of some situations. Um, alternatively, it might leave the heat in the situations, but really facilitate everyone's freedom of expression. Which sort of leads on to my, uh, my next suggestion, um, which is to recognize complete competing rights. And this comes back to that language that I mentioned at the start. You have to do uh, your duties. It is only, go to, it's only to go so far as what's reasonably, reasonably practical and within the law. And that leaves space for a balance of rights. So when um, you come across these, uh, these situations where you've got a very controversial speaker or debate, it's important to treat them as individual cases, analyze the facts and the potential repercussions. Um, the impact of both the event and the perceived endorsement by the institution. Look at the context. What other events are occurring at the at the same time? Are other views being platformed in the same way? Is there are there is there any mitigation um, to the, the the harms that this event might cause? Is this event in line with the public sector equality duty? Is it going to facilitate? Um, advancing equality of opportunity between different uh, between marginalized communities and non-marginalized communities or is this the event going to uh, have a speaker who roundly attacks um, marginalized communities and encourages the opposite of that most importantly it's important to get legal advice early most people take legal advice once something goes wrong the best time to take legal advice is before anything has got, gone wrong, so you avoid the problem, or at least find that when you get to the problem, you've got a strategy to deal with it. Finally, and this might seem a bit off the wall, but my encouragement to you is to tackle this issue head on. I'm, I'm sorry to sit, have to say it, there's a real chance that you may see regulatory action, you may see private suits against you. Um, the best way to avoid this is to assume that you will end up in court and hope that you won't. If you keep your head down and try to um, just hope that uh, that nothing will happen, um, the OFS won't, uh, won't notice you, um, it's likely you're going to be ill-prepared uh, when, when it does. Um, because a lot of these things are out of institutions' control. It's not in your control whether someone decides to make a political point by suing you. It's not in your control whether the OFS also decides to make um, make a statement uh, by investigating you. So it's really important to get ahead of this. Make sure you've got a clear policy or code of conduct in place. Make sure you've consulted widely on that code. Um, Make sure that research, uh, you do your research both generally and into specific speakers and that you take legal advice before you need it. I would suggest taking legal advice at the point of drawing up your policies and codes, not um, when you get into ad hoc, uh, uh, ad hoc decision making around specific events. Those are my suggestions. Um, I realize that we're getting towards the end of this, but I'd be delighted to take a, a couple of questions. Um, and I see that we've had uh, a, num a couple in the chat. The first, would we be able to receive these, these slides afterwards, please? Yes. Um, the uh, the next, uh, next question is, uh, you talked a bit about criticism of beliefs expressed being protected. How does the, this work with the chilling effect? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and the, it all comes down to how is the context of the criticism and how it's being framed. So 
it is perfectly. Let's and uh, let me give you an example. Actually, here you go. This is a um, this uh, this slide here, um, which I skipped over for time, um, is a, uh, a, a the the letter the the flyer that went round. Um, I think S uh, Essex University. Um, in relation to Joe Phoenix, uh, the inv uh, invitation to Joe Phoenix to, to speak there. Um, and it's a really good example, because on one um, side of it, you've got a reasoned critique, certainly a reasoned critique um, in very strong language, um, but a, a reasoned critique nonetheless. On the other side, you've got a cartoon um, that certainly at, at first instance looks pretty problematic um and so if your if um your critique is certainly if your critique is that argument's internally inconsistent that argument's without evidence that's not very good academic work well that's fine that's something we all have to suck it up and deal with in the academic community because that's the essence of the academic community um, if your critique is, I strongly disagree with your politics, even if your critique is, I think you're a bigot or a racist. People are allowed to say these things. Other people have freedom of speech too. However, if the critique then uh, goes in, strays into the realm of harassment or threats, uh, or for example, uh, pointing, you know, threatening someone with a, with a, with a gun, um, or the picture of a gun, um, the insinuation of violence that's that's in this this picture. Um, well, that's when it starts to get problematic, and that's when um, you might you might see a chilling effect. Um, however, you can't it, you certainly can't go as far as to say, um, well, we can't have people criticizing each other's work because then people will feel uh, feel a chilling effect, or we can't have people criticizing each other's um, political positions because then there'll be a chilling effect. In a democratic society, critique is essential, and more than essential, it's protected by law. Um, that was a really brilliant question to sort of finish uh, finish this up on. Thank you so much for that. Um, the just to to wrap this up, um, obviously, I'm doing a, a lot of work on this. Um, Cornerstone Barristers has an excellent uh, public law team, all of whom are highly versed in uh in, in equalities law human rights and the freedom of speech act um we are certainly available to assist with the drafting of, of policies uh, or or just general advice or, or conversations um we have a lot of experience drafting policies across a range of different public sector um the public sector areas uh, and uh, and so we would be delighted to to assist you uh, if we can and of course uh, once the um other parts of the the freedom of speech act come into uh, coming to force particularly the statutory tort uh, or if you are there are um is regulatory action taken by the office for students that's also something um that we would be delighted uh, to assist with if we can um do please uh, do please get in touch with us if we can uh, uh, can advise you on on any specifics. And thank you very much.